podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first time Stephen King reader. We are, of course, continuing our read of The Stand. I don't know if I talked about this last time, because I honestly don't remember last time very well. I am recovered, thank God. But this is my original copy of The Stand that I bought in like the year 2000. It is well-loved and tore up and put together, literally held together by tape. (laughs) So it's my copy. We are reading, we're still in book one. Um, We are finishing book one tonight. So chapters 26 through 42, about 182 pages um, from 836 to 1603 in the audio book. Thank you for that. And what's happened so far up until we started this chapter? What what did we talk about last time? So uh, give a quick rundown. Uh, A guy was working in a military installation, got infected with a massive outbreak of a super flu. Instead of doing what he was supposed to and staying there and containing it, he ran. Everybody's dead now. Uh, that's well, almost everybody's dead now. Uh, it was a 99.6% uh, communicability and effective rate. Uh, there are several people that are immune, such as uh, Larry and Stu, uh, Larry Underwood, Stu, uh, I'm trying to remember the names, Redmond, uh, Redmond. Redmond Franny Goldschmidt. And several others we're going to meet along the way. Uh, we kind of get some of their backstories. Nick Aldros, Andros, uh, Andros, we get his Andros. We get his backstory, and everybody's kind of separated right now. Nobody knows each other, and it's we're entering right now what is known as the isolation phase. You know, everybody's kind of figuring out the new normal. Do we wear masks? Do we need to get vaccinated? What do we do? We go buy all the toilet paper. <laughs> go steal all right. the whiskey. Pretty much. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 where where we kind of left off. Um, and then we pick up with what might be one of the most entertaining chapters in this chapter 26, yes. where we hear about a variety of now remember, this is people are getting sick. They're not. Not everybody's dead yet, but in chapter 26, there's a lot of people with a lot of angst and a lot of anger and quite frankly, justified. Um, So Luke, do you want to read our recap of 26 for us? Yeah, so our summary, again, I have pulled these from a person named John Birmingham. Um, I will put the link to his whole set of descriptions in the chat right now as well uh, did a pretty good job on breaking these chapters down for us so chapter 26 some campus group probably either students for a democratic society or the young maoists had been busy that's the first line of the chapter Mm -hmm. Um, a boston tv anchor tries to tell the true story a small town newspaper tries to tell the true story la times tries to tell the true story (laughs) ray flowers murdered by soldiers live on radio radio and more in springfield missouri in springfield missouri yep (laughs) and uh there are more scenes from the media ending with a scene from the president Mm -hmm. yeah telling everybody not to worry the vaccine's on the way it just relax rest as he's hawking up along you know live on tv you know it's yeah but it's a well done chapter because it's realistic i mean if you know they're trying to control the information 
you mm-hmm. you know you do what you can though like starting with we'll, we'll kind of skip over the campus ones uh for now that's kind of an obvious one even though it's a heart-wrenching like you're the I, I like the way that actually i won't skip over that i like the way that one was written because you're getting it through the radio communications of the security guards you're not even right. getting like on you're you're basically hearing the from dispatch's point of view of oh my god what the hell are they doing you know it's a murder you know zone down here and all this and it's like Okay, that's a that's an interesting little take the way they spun that, but the TV reporter one that's that's the really cool one. Basically, he he calls it. I was like, we've been held basically at gunpoint to read you verbatim what we're supposed to say. Yeah, we're not doing that. We're gonna go as long as we can, and it was just yeah, well done, and kind of built the drama of the whole. I don't remember the LA Times one or the newspaper one. I don't re- recall the. So the newspaper one was literally the Los Angeles Times. I have it right here. It ran only 26,000 copies of their one-page extra before officers in charge discovered that they were not printing a circular. Um, The reprisal was swift and bloody. And then of those, like, um, 10,000 copies got out, and it basically was like the headline, West Coast in Grip of Plague Epidemic. And then it's got, like... um, all these different points like i have five questions for the president why have we been kept from printing the news by thugs in uniform why have these highways been blocked off if this is a minor outbreak why has martial law been declared if this is a minor outbreak why are barge trains being towed out to the pacific ocean and dumped full of what we believe are dead bodies right Mm -hmm. and why if there is a vaccine coming have the 46 different doctors we've talked to not been contacted or heard any information about it at all yeah, good questions mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, i think the radio host one was my favorite in this section with the guy who just shows up and he goes you know what i'm just gonna do what i can it's only me here today call in i know what's on your mind let's just talk about it and he gets through a couple phone calls uh, you know, no commercials or anything, because he's like, we're not going to do that either. You know what? Why? Not? Nobody's out shopping. Right. Yeah. No one's out shopping right now anyway. So, uh, yeah, I liked that that scene quite a bit. And, you know, he eventually gets shut down by some soldiers who came and shoot the lock off the door, come in and just say, you know, if you say another word, we're going to take you down. And he says, well, it looks like they've just issued me my final warning or something, and they they shoot him. Oh man! But then the the crew, the soldiers, fire on their commander because they don't think what happened was okay. Like they they all kind of went against. You know, they didn't shoot. It was just the commander that did the shooting, mm-hmm. and they took it upon themselves to uh, wipe him out uh, immediately after that. And they were like, "That's not what we're doing. We're not shooting civilians for no reason." So, yeah, pretty. And exciting. then they were summarily executed for treason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Something else that comes up in this chapter that I think is funny that like so everybody's freaking out, right? The whole country is freaking out. We keep getting reports, and in one of them, in Boulder, there's that. Um, Medi- the meteorological air testing center but like one of the radio djs who was semi-delirious is like that's not a real meteorological that's like you know warfare medical warfare da, 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 da. so like he stirs up this big riot of other semi-delirious people and it says there was like a lemming like uh hold on i lost a lemming like exodus from boulder where where are they gonna go? But like oh, like in such panic, the whole town clears out, right? A company of soldiers was sent out from Denver to stop them, but it was like sending a man with a whisk broom to clean out the I'm gonna say it wrong Augean state Augean from from um, Greek mythology the stables better than eleven thousand citizens skip sick scared and with no other thought to get as many miles between them and the air testing center rolled over the Mm -hmm. like military thing that had come to get them right and thousands of other boulderites went like they just scattered you know it's like shining a flashlight on cockroaches they just like ran (laughs) because of the meteorological center that's a not real meteorological center even though it really is i don't know it's funny Mm -hmm. um what else 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think that with the wrap up scene in that chapter is pretty good too. The president, which you kind of already mentioned, you know, he's coughing and sneezing the whole time he's telling you. I just want to get out ahead of this and say it's a flat out lie that you know we're covering up any information, and then you know if you get this flu it's it's only gonna be with you for a week and then you'll be fine stay on fluids and like it's not fatal <laughs> just stuff like i do think to... the semi-naked black man executing soldiers on live tv is worth mentioning mm -hmm. yes just, out of san francisco right or not or uh, portland, portland, maine. portland maine portland maine okay mm -hmm. gotcha yeah. yeah i could because it, it gets mentioned later on in a franny sure chapter does. as well so that's why yes. I can't remember if it happened yeah. here, but yeah, that was interesting for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Just taken because they were they were uniform soldiers, right? That he was executed yeah. on on TV. Yeah. I think was it? Did he have all their um, dog tags? And he would just like, oh, driver's license. He put all of their driver's license in um, a, a bingo, bingo hall, mm -hmm. hall yeah. popped it out, and they were like, "I'll take so and so," and like all the guys give up the guy. Oh, that's him right here. He's there. <laughs> like it's gonna save them. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're just shooting people. I whew, it, yeah, it was bad, a rough. Quick. Yeah. 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 Got pretty pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. And like I'm not gonna say it all makes sense, right? Because the live executions, but like I kind of get it, right? Like the military well, I mean, have been yeah I, I, on that one all crazy think, you know, yeah i mean the one that makes the most sense to me are the soldiers standing up to their commanding officer at the radio mm, station mm -hmm. you know that one made absolute sense but the guy in in portland the reason i was thinking west coast was that i heard portland i didn't hear portland maine but it makes sense mm -hmm. why we heard later from franny that she saw that so yeah because she's close but so uh yeah it's it makes sense that it would happen people would be, yeah would get fed up and just you know shit goes crazy you know when martial law hits and you have no rules no governance apart from just getting killed for your actions you know mm -hmm. you don't really have much left to live for so might as well go out with a bang hence a guy will hear about it in the next chapter <laughs> oh all right let's move on anything else about chapter 26 and the hell that is breaking loose throughout the semi-coherent living no, nothing yeah. specifically. I do like these little vignette chapters, though, that we've kind of gotten throughout. There's mm -hmm. some definite comedy that he gets to throw in when you have those, where, like, with the full narrative chapters is what I'll call them. There's, it's more plot and story. There's this, I don't know, I like the change of pace of them. I will say, the very last part of this chapter says, Graffiti, written on the front of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta in red spray paint. Dear Jesus, I will see you soon. Your friend, America. P.S. I hope you will still have some vacancies by the end of this week. Yeah, I thought that was good. It's, it, you know, the, the great toilet paper rush of 2020 does not seem so bad <laughs> right. as, as, as this, because at the very least, some people lived. Okay, moving on. Chapter 27. It's a Larry chapter. It is. It's a Larry chapter. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> Luke. Larry Underwood sat on a bench in Central Park on the morning of June 27th, looking into the menagerie. So that's the first line of the chapter. New York is almost dead, and Larry might be going crazy. Monster shouters, dazed survivors. Chance of a lifetime man. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Larry regrets his split with Rudy, and he meets Rita Blakemore. Uh, they have a lunch date. Yeah. So, so the one I, the what I was mentioning, the going out with a bang was the chance of a lifetime man who decided he wanted to run naked across Yankee Field. Yankees or was it Chase Stadium? Or Yankee, Yankee Stadium. Stadium. Yankee, Yankee Stadium. Stadium. Oh, come on, Chase Stadium would be yeah. stupid. Yankee Stadium's but, a much better choice. Well, yeah, Chase Stadium's got a better sound system. Anyway, but uh, you know, run, run around uh, Yankee Stadium naked and then have have his way with himself on home plate just because you can. Yeah. Because you got to live it. Yeah. <laughs> I loved uh, Rita's response to that when she found out. He, she goes, why don't you tell him somewhere closer? That's such a far walk. <laughs> Honestly, I was thinking the same thing. Like, you, you have to cross a river. Like, 
you got to go a, far to way. get from Manhattan to, yeah. you know, how about, how about like, I don't know, Madison Square Garden. Yeah. That's on Island. Yeah. That's, I that's, mean, granted that's right though, there. right. Although it is baseball season, it is June and July. So, okay. Yeah. Either way. <laughs> interesting. Interesting uh, thing to do at the end of the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we find out that Larry's mother died. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sure. And he he got to watch that happen, and he was like, "Well, nothing else I can do, so I'm just gonna go now." <laughs> and he pinned her like address to her shirt or something like that. I left her at the hospital. Although at least she got to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Not that it was helpful yeah obviously yeah no but that's it was still like yeah him kind of coping with that and her last real words to him resonate like her last cognizant words the taker thing and you know kind of dealing with all that uh and then yeah we get the story of rudy and i'm trying rudy was just was Rudy the one that gave him the <laughs> like over in la gave him the kick in the ass no, 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 this no. Is, Rudy was the oh. one they left New York together to seek their fortune in LA. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he borrowed 15 bucks from him. And when Rudy asked for it back, Larry was like, I already paid you back. You, you know, why are you trying to steal money from me? And it was all Larry being an it idiot. Was, and it was 25 because 25, Larry had yeah. three tens in his wallet yeah. and was like, well, if I give you 25, then I only have five. And that means. I will. Have, I must have already paid you back because I can't possibly only have that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So he felt bad about that, and you know, it, he he pretty much says that you know for a long time I didn't know if he had really paid me back or not, but I'm pretty hundred percent sure that he did. So, yeah. We also find and out about his past girlfriend Yvonne. Mm -hmm. Oh, Vaughn. Yeah. yeah. The stripper. Yeah. 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 That fell apart. Yeah, that didn't end so hotly. And then Monster Shutter. And then Rita. Yeah. Rita, who in the 2020 stand is played by Heather Graham. She is actually not a character in the 1994. Uh she it was combined with another character that we'll meet later. Mm -hmm. So interesting. That that, right. that role. Yeah, so, but yeah, Heather Graham plays her in the 2020 version. Which, yeah, Heather fitting. Graham, old enough to yeah, play I mean, Rita? She's, she's late 40s, early 50, you know, by this point. Uh, let's see. I don't know, maybe I picture Rita as older than that, but I, as... I think she's She's, she's 52. Heather, Heather Graham's 52. I mean, and Rita, that I mean, Stu really is only 27, so in his head, a 52-year-old would be... You mean Larry? Larry, sorry, yeah. So Larry, yeah, Larry's 23. Sorry, I'm blanking on character. She's even younger. He's like 23, 24. And uh, so, yeah, in his head, a 52-year-old would be considered significantly older. Yeah, I just pictured her as older than that. But, you know, as somebody who's way closer to that than I am to Larry, I don't <laughs> want to think about that. So I, it could be my perspective is off. It's fine. Okay. So we meet Rita. They go out to lunch. That's about it. The monkey in Central Park dies. Yeah. She shoots her pistol just to see if she knows yes. how. Yes. That's about it, though. I mean, he he had gone into a restaurant earlier in the day and poured an entire water glass full of what was it? Johnny Walker. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know what? I don't even want this. So he just <laughs> left it sitting there on the bar. Uh and then they do they did go to a restaurant and he cooked for her in the restaurant, which was a nice yeah. thing that he did. So yeah. yeah, I think that's about it for now though on that chapter. Okay. Twenty seven. Franny. Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Franny. <laughs> Franny. Oh Franny. Take it, Ben. So there was a strawberry pie in the fridge. It was covered with saran wrap, and after looking at it for a long time with dull, bemused eyes, Franny took it out. Uh, Franny buries her dad, scenes from around the town. 
Harold Lauder visits and she dreams. So, yeah, with this chapter, with the the original, it's a lot of inner monologue stuff. She, you know, she ends up being her father in the garden and it's her just kind of contemplating everything and her thinking about Harold uh, when he first comes by and everything. And it's not a bad chapter. Like these kind of chapters where it's very introspective and, you know, it, inner thought i kind of gl- gloss over because it's like eh, i don't care there wasn't like a lot of backstory we had with like larry chapter p- previously it was more just her how she's feeling at the moment and i'm not saying it's a bad thing it's a good chapter. yeah it, it's just my mentality it's more just her feelings and her you know i think it's interesting to watch her spiral in and out of not really consciousness but spiral in and out of sanity might be the better way. Yeah. I really like the fact that, she, like, she goes on a whole tangent about the fly and the pie and the whatever, and she's like, "I have fries," and all of a sudden she sees the smoke, and you know she's about to burn the house down, and and it's a beautiful day, and it's a beautiful day, and there's something about this beautiful day. I wonder what it is about this beautiful day, and it's a beautiful warm day, and all it's of a, a sudden warm, it clicks. Beautiful day. It's a yeah. warm beautiful day, and my father is dead upstairs, and it's warm. Mm-hmm. And what's going to happen because it's warm? Yeah. To me, that like, I agree. For the most part, those kind of chapters, I'm like, look, but she has to bury her dad. She's going through a pretty intense yeah. shock right now. And that's, I think, what we're seeing is the loss of grip on reality to some extent because her yeah. body is protecting itself mentally. And yeah, I mean, that's that's a hard thing that she has to buck up and do because she's even saying, you know, like mm-hmm. once she realized that's what's going on in her head, like that's what her mind is trying to get to. She even kind of gets mm-hmm. mad at herself, like just say it out loud, like just just say the thing because your your mind is dancing around it on purpose to, uh, you know, protect yourself. But she's like, I have to bury my dad because nobody else will. I have mm-hmm. to do it. like there's no one else that can come and do it. So. Yeah, and so she does that, right? And she takes, gets his body out. Oh, we got a picture? Hmm. Okay. Interesting. He's carrying him down the stairs. Yeah, so she gets him outside and starts digging in the garden, right? And I don't know if you've ever mm-hmm. dug a hole. Um, it's uh, It's hard work, and she's pregnant. Like, not so far along that it's probably that big of a deal, but it's a lot of extra exertion that... uh. I don't think she, she probably doesn't need. Yeah, that's right. I, I, yeah, and she. I don't think she. <laughs> I don't think she probably should be doing it. But again, yeah. nobody else will. Um, right. So, yeah, it was interesting that she's digging the hole, right? And then uh, her one of her best friends' little brother comes over, uh, just because he's going around town seeing who's alive and who's not, and so he checks on her and. We learn a little bit about him. Definitely kind of a weird dude. Uh, seems to mean well, but definitely a bit peculiar. Uh, someone she's not a huge fan of to begin with. Mm-hmm. So with, with the Herald stuff, uh, like, I, I get where she's coming from, and I get we're getting from her perspective and everything, but she's letting a lot of stuff skew her opinion based off of what his sister told her about mm-hmm. him. Uh, now, in fairness, you're going to trust your friend when they tell you about their brother and everything like that. But it, it's just she's she focuses heavily on that when he seems to genuinely, at least in this chapter, he's genuinely trying to be kind and, you know, like in his way, like he yes, he's odd. He's not, you know, he's an odd duck, but he's trying to actually be helpful and kind. And yeah, fine. Maybe he's a little horny ball, horn ball, too. But He's not trying to show it. He's not trying to, you know, take it advantage. He's just, he's trying his best with it. It's just coming off because we're getting it from her perspective. It's coming off very creepy and very just weird when in all reality, if you read what he was just saying, it's like, okay, yeah. I mean, it's a normal kind of conversation in a weird roundabout, you know, you know, with a weird tint to it, you know, at at first she's not just getting it from what she hears from the sister. Like, He's in town, and he's an odd little kid. Like he was, a, he's always been a kid, and she was the best friend, so she was around a lot. So, like, 
that's fair. That's fair. She yeah. has firsthand knowledge. And like you say, oh, he was creepy from her point of view. Yeah, he was creepy from a female's point of view. And that's what it is because like if he makes her feel uncomfortable, then she gets to feel uncomfortable because he is creepy and does not and understand that his actions and his like mannerisms are not appropriate. He's trying, but he doesn't un- like he does not have social awareness. Yes. So I, one like, bit. you're absolutely correct. I, w- I was trying to kind of frame it in the sense of I you're absolutely right. Uh, it was more in my mind of reading the chapter itself. I can see it as he's trying. Is he doing a bad job of it? Yes. And it's because he has no social awareness, but he's in his mind not trying to be creepy he's just trying to be helpful and i know it, it, i mean I, yeah. I get that but like yeah that's not her problem that's how i no. feel about it like i got shit get out you know and speaking of which Cheryl laudner in 2020 is played by owen teague and 1994 i had it oh where did he go molly ringwald i don't even have to look it up i already did her. yeah i said her that was uh oh, you did i said that one last episode yes it did oh well yeah, I'm only going by new characters, mm. uh, and this is uh, K- Corin Nemec was 1994. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's an interesting check because he tries again, tries to help. He offers to help Barry Den. She's like, not any time, and he fucks off. He's like, okay, you know, I'll see you around, right. and takes off, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and she goes and finishes the job with it. I, I don't know how the chapter ends. Uh, on it she falls she falls asleep um she has a dream about the walk-in dude yep gotcha yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i don't specifically remember what that dream was about though i mean i other than about him i can't remember what what he does in it it's it's basically like her dad it's the dead body under the cloth only it's not really her dad and the hand comes out in her hand and then she snatches the tablecloth and it says he was grinning but she couldn't see his face a wave of frigid cold blast up at her that awful grin no she couldn't see his face but she could see the gift of this terrible apparition had brought for her unborn baby a twist twisted coat hanger which is you know yeah. whoo so and then she wakes up and then she thinks it's him it's him it's the walking dude the man with no face that's what she thinks as she's awake and then she falls asleep and ends the chapter well all right 29 29 so that same evening as larry underwood slept with rita blake moore and as franny goldsmith slept alone dreaming her peculiarly ominous dream Stu redmond was waiting for elder Stu escapes Oh, going Tharn. Mm-hmm. Like, what a great, first of all, the fact that Stu knows that they're coming for him, that he has figured out based on just his week in captivity and all the crazy, like, they're they're coming. Yeah, they're not letting they're, me they're out gonna of this. Keep, No. I, I don't think I appreciated the first few times through this book just how bright Stu is because yeah, he's not dumb. he's down right but they kind of downplay it right it's he's you know this quiet dude from east texas kind of a country boy and and just and they never come flat out and say oh i'm so smart like they do with harold or you know larry who's this big talented musician it's just Stu, but like there's a lot going on up there. He's figured all of it out. He knows what's going on without any information, just by what he watches and observes. Him getting out is fantastic. Yeah, no, I love when he basically has it all figured out that the next time someone comes and checks on me, I think that's and is alone. Be... Right. And, and is alone. Yeah. He he pretty much knows that that's gonna be the end of the line for him. And uh so when that happens, he sort of pulls like the hey what's that <laughs> like just to get the guy to <laughs> turn around you go what you got rats in here what's that rat, rat doing here and in that moment he picks up the side table and breaks it over the guy's back and basically kills the guy uh with it and um he has the, to go back and shoot him again does he okay yeah because mm-hmm. he starts to get up like he thought he was down and out 
And then as he's walking out the door, uh, he gets up. And I don't remember if the character's name was Stubbs. Uh, no, it was... Vic. 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 But Vic, it was more of a mercy thing because Vic's sick and he's like, you're not supposed to be out. And Stu's like, yeah, I'm going. And Vic's like, I don't blame you. And then Stu's like, can I do anything for you? He says, Vic's you like, yep, pretty much. And he doesn't um, shoot him, though. I don't think he shoots him, does he? No, he doesn't. He leaves him. Poor Vic. I wish he would have because, like, I mean, I get, like, in that moment because he's trying so hard not to lose himself to panic that that could have put him over the edge and that last like little i can't believe that i did that mm -hmm. but it would have been a mercy killing yeah i think so i mean and the guy's begging for it you know he's literally suffering uh, immensely so his insides are being ripped apart is what he was saying and mm -hmm. that's not a good thing um but he does end up leaving there he sees a couple other dead bodies laying around the, the facility as he's walking out um, I think there was one of the doctors as well in there that mm -hmm. was basically a, just a corpse now that he recognized from earlier in his stay there. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think the nurse that originally brought it in, I think might have been seen. Is that but maybe not Missy I, or something? She had yeah, a, I don't she remember. Had a chapter I, in our last section. Yeah. Wasn't she? She was in. Um... Was Atlanta. I don't... Atlanta. I think that was in Atlanta. Yeah, I don't think she was oh, in was Stovington. Oh, it was because right, of her yeah, that, yeah. that the Atlanta that, facility got shut down. That's and right. Came up to what, Stovington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he got out. Yeah. I'm alive. I'm alive. Thank God I'm alive. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I'm alive. Chapter 30. Chapter 30. Dust blew straight across the Texas scrubland. Short chapter, Arnett as a ghost town. It's that big. Pretty short chapter. I feel like I just read more than a quarter of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Basically, it, it's talking about how absolutely empty it is. The one thing that um, someone had left the gas on in Norm Bruett's house, and the, and the day before, a spark of the air conditioner had blown the whole place sky high, rattling lumber and shingles and Fisher-Price toys all over Laurel Street. So, mm -hmm. yeah. My favorite is the end. The town was, except for the chur and whisper of small animals and the tinkle of Tony Leominster's wind chimes, silent and silent and silent. I think it's a really good visual of this is where our story didn't exactly start here, right? We started with um, the running from the military installment, but this was our first real location. Mm -hmm. in america and here now we're done there that place is done yep. it's just empty so i like that chapter 31 go for it bench christopher branton struggled out of delirium like a man struggling out of quicksand a minion of flags lying dead flag drives away a chapter cut from the first edition so this one, I think this is this where we first get the name flag, uh, because up until now he's been the walking dude. He hasn't introduced himself to anybody, and Blanton or Brandon was like, or flag was talking to him was like the car, the car, it's parked over here under the name flag, you know. And so I think that's where he takes the name from. It's what Br so Brandon is the one who named him technically, not. Because uh, Bradenton knew him as um, Fry. So okay. he knew the guy as, see if I can find it. Give me a second. The man he knew as Richard Fry. So the whole chapter he's referred to as last name Fry, but it's not until yeah. he says papers in the name of Randall the flag, well stretcher downstairs. So Richard Fry, Randall flag. Yeah. Yep. Cool. He gets pretty straightforward. Car. Bradenton was kind of a jerk, like kind of a ugh, character anyway. Kind of, yeah, sleazy. Yeah, that's a good word for him. And then we go on to chapter 32. All right. Chapter 32. 
Someone had left the door open between maximum security and the cell block beyond it. Lloyd Henro Henried Henry? That's weird. That's a weird name. Um is trapped in his prison cell, starving, thinking about <laughs> thinking of eating his cellmate. Uh so I, I think this is an interesting chapter we get to spend with Lloyd where he's really starting to suffer a lot from uh starvation. And he had we learn about how he had collected and saved and rationed some of his food along the mm -hmm. way, which brilliant. I mean that that's the only reason he's still alive and the other guy's dead. Um, he did, he was able to catch a cockroach and ate it. Uh, he was able to catch a rat and mm -hmm. was saving that, uh, for a little bit further on. And, uh, just, you know, his cellmate that's dead, uh, next door, uh, Trask, Trask, he, Trask. he decides to, Lloyd decides to pull his body just a little bit closer to where it's going to be reachable. Just in case, I don't want to. I don't want to eat you, old buddy. But yeah, I gotta be careful still. <laughs> like, because here's the thing. I, I mean, Lloyd. Lloyd is kind of a cartoon character. Oh like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's yeah. he's like this bumbling idiot bad guy who's like not quite a bad guy, but he's bad enough to be with bad guys because he's kind of okay. But I mean, think about the predicament he's in. Everybody around him is dying, including the people in charge of him. He's literally dependent upon people to bring him food and bring him things, and he has no way to save himself. Mm, right? Like, right. you know, everybody else we've met, even Stu, had, well, he was locked up, but he was smart, so he knew it was coming the ability to kind of go Lloyd is not that smart so everybody else like they can go to the store and get the food sitting on the shelves and they can go to the town pump or get a bottle of water like but Lloyd has he's just there it's a lot like the uh the guys that beat up Nick right where he was yeah. deputized and yes. basically let the one go because he was like, well, he's going to die here if I keep him locked up. Mm -hmm. Like, there's nothing we can do. So it's almost like the same idea, but on the reverse, where there's no one yes. there to let him out. I mean, or do anything. I and mean, yeah, he's fundamentally trapped in a death cage right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so this is also the chapter where Lloyd, and I, I understand why you saw the last name Henry was weird, because I keep hearing it as Henry. Mm -hmm. Like so I thought I was thinking mm -hmm. his name's Lloyd Henry, not Henry. But anyway, uh we for some reason he starts unscrewing the nuts on his bed, get, like working his fingers quite literally to the bone almost, trying to get it unscrewed for no for no reason. He just is just to have something to do. Like they don't I don't um, think he ever specifically yes, yes. is there he reason. Was taking the leg off so that he could use it to catch the leg of his oh, okay. It, gotcha. Like, use it to read neighbor. Further. That's okay. He fair. was fashioning a giant poking device. <laughs> yeah, but that's fair. Okay. A, a and then also, a fishing pole. We well, this is also the yeah. scene where we keep getting the mother, mother, mother. mother. Yeah. And like it, it very much had like a callback, flash forward. I guess since this was before, I believe it was Doctor Sleep. We had a very similar uh, scene in a jail where the guy keeps singing. All I, or no, it was not Dr. Sleep. That, that was, uh, oh, uh, Revival. All I need is somebody to love. Like, he kept singing out uh, while uh, the main guy was in his drunken stupor or his stone stupor. Mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of made me think of that kind of similar thing where you're like, you're, you have like nothing else to lose. You just go call out this guy. You tell he's dying. He's just calling for mom. The other guy was drunk off his mind, just singing whatever Bon Jovi song he could think of. But it was just like a weird, like how we do with all the rest of our books, those little connections. And that was one that stood out to me. Okay. I, t I was thinking more of just like some guy on his deathbed who was like, you know, hallucinating because we know, you know, that, but I yeah. think more of a literal thing. But I'll, I'll... no, no, I agree. It. It's, yeah. So by the end of the chapter, we get visited by 
Mr. Randall Flagg, right? Nope. No. Nope. No. no. That's another, another no. chapter. Okay. False. Yeah. This, this is the Reek chapter. This is the first half of the Reek chapter, sure. as sure. you know, it <laughs> makes me think. No, that's fair. That's fair. All right. Yeah. 33. Chapter 33. We finally get back to, to Nick, Nick Andros, who, who was doing better. Like he was doing okay here. Right? Yeah. And so at 22 minutes of nine, by the clock over the sheriff's office doorway, the lights went off. Uh, the power finally fails to the jailhouse where Nick is staying, and he is attacked by none other than the sheriff's brother-in-law, Ray Booth. Uh, and Nick fights him off. Yeah, it's short. It's only like a four-page chapter. Um, yeah. And basically, like, you know, lights go out, and then there's Ray. And they fight, and a gun goes off, and then a gun goes off again. And the first time, basically, Nick got shot down the leg, not through the leg, but like down yeah. the side of his leg. And then there's some eye gouging, and then Ray gets shot on top of Nick. Nick has to crawl out from under dead Ray. Yes? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the lights are out. On the move, yeah. right? He's He's out and about a little bit mm -hmm. mm. all right chapter 34 i'm gonna do this one i'm okay. gonna do this Good. one Good for a long okay. time donald merwin elbert known to the inmates inmates of the dim and confusing grade school past as the trash can man had wandered up and down the streets of poutonville indiana oh we meet trashy and get his life story while he blows up a giant gas tank Hey, so this trash is, can man. Yeah, th this is a chapter that even King said in the foreword that this was a lot of this was added back in for the new, like getting his backstory and everything. And yeah, I'm so glad we got this because yeah, getting, you know, it's just how a system fails a kid. You know, this is the perfect example of how a system can just straight up fail a kid, and this is what you get. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I, I mean, thought Trashy was pretty interesting. I mean, it's 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 an interesting story where he goes from his dad, who's drunk, right, gets <laughs> shot by the police officer, the the sheriff. After he town. shoots all of his kids except Donald, right, and then, well, and not the wife either, right? Not not his mom, right? But then his mom ends up marrying that sheriff, uh, the officer that shot his dad. And yeah, it, it, it and then gets... the sheriff gets him committed because he's been setting fires to things. And mm -hmm. because of that, the mom divorces the sheriff because honestly, the sheriff was probably right that the kid needed help. Mm -hmm. Not that, and granted, he probably needed therapy and not institutionalism, but you know, this was also. 50 years ago so you know you do what you can but then the mom defends her son even though he probably didn't deserve that and they divorce the sheriff the sheriff ends up having this like terrible life working in a factory trash can man comes back works the gas no car wash yeah mm -hmm. and then sets fire to the church yeah why'd you burn down the church and not the school trash can Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously gets the name Trash Can for setting fires in people's trash cans all up down the uh, street he grew up on. So. Yeah. yeah. And as we're learning about this, he's walking up the tower of an oil refinery plant with, you know, blowtorch or whatever else in hand. You a know, gas can? A yeah, dude, gas can and, well, yeah. But like, no, whatever. Blowtorch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, set, strings it up and just lights it up and kind of walks away and just enjoys the show you know <laughs> it's oh trash uh, trashy uh, in uh is matt Fu brewer in 94 and ezra miller <gasps> oh that makes so much sense it, it really really <laughs> yeah. does yeah ezra miller in uh night air in 2020 he is perfectly weird enough to play trash can man yeah. Fair. Okay. <laughs> Good chapter. 35. Though. Interesting character yes. for sure. Yes. I want to get out of this city, Rita said, without turning around. She's right. Manhattan is a chan a carnal house. Carnal house. That's 
Oh. All right, get out of here. Larry has noticed she is older, too. They eat eggs and plan an escape. We get the deets on their brief relationship. <laughs> My phone just got stolen. Uh, they get up and walk. Apocalypse scenes. Things are tense between them. Rita runs away. Larry goes into the dark Lincoln Tunnel. She catches up with him. They exit NYC. This was an intense chapter. Like, I feel like there's the Rita stuff and Larry trying really hard to not be Larry. But the tunnel, like, I, this is one of those things that, you know, decades after reading this book, if you ask me about the stand, there are some things that stand out. And this tunnel is one of them of just like the sheer terror of walking over dead people and not knowing what else is in there and knowing that people were getting shot ahead. Like the tunnel terrifies me. That I would say this is so far like the most walking dead esque type scene where it's like, yeah, yeah. you could have easily convinced me that the zombies were going to be in that tunnel yeah. or something. Like it would, it, the way the scene was set, that would have felt, a thousand percent nat natural and not and you would have believed it at all yeah not surprising at all like almost mm -hmm. it's surprising that it wasn't that to something like the way it, <laughs> the way it's it's described and it, it puts you you know i i think the very opening scene that we have in it where he goes down to the basement and he's got that similar fear of the dark i think this kind of gets back to that same obviously this was written before that but it hits a very, very similar vibe to it of, you know, the fear of the unknown. And specifically, this is a pretty gruesome scene of having to walk over car carcasses at this point. And yeah, I, I think it was really, really well described. So my only real take on this one, besides the, yeah, how dumb are you to wear open-toed sandals on a hike across Manhattan, but I didn't uh, let know. alone, yeah. besides that, why would you go to the tunnel? There are several bridges out of New York. There are some very famous bridges out of New York. There's some <laughs> very famous well bridges. Well-constructed bridges. <laughs> keeps you in the daylight, keeps you, you know, not having, and yeah, fine, you might want to go to Jersey for some reason, but you can get around. I don't know. I don't know the area. It's just, I, I had to go with the, the running joke. But, it's funny. Keep know, going. I know. But, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't know where geographically how they fell and if the Lincoln Tunnel was the closest. You know what? Suck it up. Go a little further because shit's already clogged in the streets. You can see that. Like, cars are just parked randomly. What makes you think Lincoln Tunnel is going to be easily accessible? At least a bridge. A little easier to get over. Daylight. You have fucking daylight. That's, and, uh, that's just kind of. And to add to that, like most bridges have like a sidewalk, like a walking path. One, I, well, this I did have know. a walkway. This had a gangway. It said, <laughs> you know, this is where he, you know, they walked that's most true. of the time. But still, <laughs> it's like, yeah, nobody wants to get Jersey. Exactly, Jake. <laughs> so that, that was kind of my big takeaway from, and I get it, suspense. You have to build drama and all that, but it's like sometimes just write smart things, you know, because <laughs> even if Larry's not the brightest, Rita's got enough age in her where she's like, eh, maybe we should take the Brooklyn Bridge or, you know, okay. take the Queen. Um, I, okay, so oh, I got to put my book down. I got to get comfortable for this one. I will tell you, I do not typically like to bash on women in books. That's your job. Rita annoys the piss out of me. Like, what the? How useless are? Grow a pair and like stand up. Okay, I can't. You know what she is? She's a grown ass woman, goddammit. Maybe she should act like one. That's all. She is very worthless. Like, very worthless. And. Yeah, I I kind of don't blame Larry for losing his patience with her being like, are you fucking kidding me? 
You your feet have been hurting you for twenty fucking blocks, and you're just saying something. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? What is what is wrong with you? And I, like, yeah, he's maybe going a little harsh, but at the same time, I think he has every right to be a little upset and maybe lose his patience with someone who's that fucking asinine. And I think that like that's what shows how young Larry is. He's trying so hard to be a grown up, and he has no he doesn't know what he's do he's not he's never done that before but he's trying so hard to be a grown-up he picked the wrong person to try with Mm -hmm. yeah that's the thing that's annoying me about larry and so he's feeling guilty because oh no i'm just being larry no you're not she's really not worth it no not at all And, and the thing is with rita she you know for lack of a better term the 70s equivalent to the Karen or the suburban housewife who, you know, like who that's all she's ever been. Like she's been like, and it's not even like a good housewife. All she's been, she's been a kept woman, hasn't had to worry about anything. Her husband's paid for everything. She never had to think about anything because it was just there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, now she's in this and she's, yeah, an anchor to, Larry's are expecting this 27 year old like wanker basically to take care of her be- like he has any idea what he's doing yeah like, yeah he's a man child he knows nothing <laughs> like yeah this is the worst uh, be better- you could probably ask for like for- you'd, you'd be better off with the monster shouter except not yeah. but like seriously he'd be better off with the home plate humper Home plate humper. Yes, because that's a guy who's going places. That, that guy is a, he is an enterprising individual with goals and dreams. He is coming and, and going, Melissa. You know, <laughs> and he's got follow through. <laughs> yeah, get her done. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we make it through the tunnel. We come out the Jersey side. Jersey's never spelled so good. Yeah. <laughs> uh. No, no. After the smell of New York, Jersey's the, never smelled so good. The rotting smell that's in the air everywhere. I, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Okay, I gotta move on. 30, I don't know, 36. Six 36. Sure. <coughs> God, Luke. There was a small park in the center of Ogonquit, complete with a Civil War cannon and a war memorial. Franny nurses Gus Dinsmore. Um, he dies. She is in shock. She finds her mowing the lawn. Uh, they drink warm Kool Aid with no sugar. Um, Harold is sad, but also smart. He suggests uh, going to Vermont to a government research lab. He paints a sign on the roof of Moses Richardson's barn, and they leave. Um. You gotta feel for Harold a little bit with the whole "I miss my mother" thing. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think and, I think we get a lot of from him in this chapter. Mm-hmm. I do too. I, you can see the human in him a lot more in this chapter than in the last one. I loved the idea of them going to Vermont. Spoiler alert: it's not going to work out so well for them. But and I like that he's got a plan, right? And it's. Like it's thoughtful and it's this is what I know. There's this makes sense. Yep. Right. Um, leaving the message on the barn. I like the message on the barn. Were your thoughts about the message on the barn? Yeah, I mean, it was basically a large sign saying, Hey, me and her, here are her names. We left on this date. If anyone's looking for us, that was our goal. Uh or if you're looking for anybody, like right. if yeah. you want people. Yeah, I thought it was or people in that way. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm disappointed he wasn't able to read a Kool Aid packet though. Like, I mean, I think so. What I what I get from him in this chapter is it's the shock is starting to really kind of hit him now, right? And he mm-hmm. he wants to feel sad. And like when it first all happened, where his mom and dad died and his sister died, he struggles with the fact that he didn't feel anything at all mm-hmm. like he thought he was like i thought i would be pretty upset but i wasn't 
but it seems like it's coming on to him now. I like that it's yeah. he it is hitting him now and he was out there cutting the grass, like running with the lawnmower, almost kind of one of those trying to run away from your your grief and try to actively do something with your body, but he wasn't doing a very good job with that and that's similar to where she was the last chapter we had where she's in the middle of a physical exertion to get away from her feelings he is too like breaking down and she catches him in that and so it's kind of like the roles were reversed a little bit she's a little Mm -hmm. bit she's found a little more solace for herself and in a better headspace now coming to grips with the reality of everything and it's just hitting him so she apologizes for how she treated him the first time, which I thought was reasonable because I I do think it's somewhere in between. He may be a little creepy, but he was just trying to be helpful. And she realizes that and gives him the benefit of the doubt of, you know, maybe you need me now, you know, maybe you need somebody here to talk to. And, and she does that for him and she drinks the nasty sugarless Kool-Aid and, uh, you know, to be polite, but they they come up with a bit of a plan, and it's a it's a pretty good plan to start for sure. Um, you know, she was like, "Well, why don't we just go right now?" And he goes, "Well, you know, we have the advantage of knowing where things are here in town. We should sleep on it and prep to be able to go rather than find ourselves two hours away <laughs> and not know anything. We we know that we're the only two here in town, so that's already safer than going to somewhere else." Where I mean, it's it's gonna be flip a coin. Is a stranger gonna be a good thing or a bad thing? Which we do see a little bit later too with these two specific characters. But um, yeah, I thought I thought the plan was good. The leaving the information was good, um, and it seems like they're getting along pretty decently. You know, like they're they're in this to work together in a in a positive way. And he earns even a bit more of her respect by doing the sign thing and putting both their names on it. She's even like, how'd you get that last line? He's like, I kind of had to hang off a little bit, hang off the roof a bit. And she was like, you didn't need to do that. He's like, yeah, I do. We're in this together. You know, we're, they need to know both of us are there. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it, it's a good, just a good chapter, good heart, heartfelt chapter all around. You know, like you said, Harold's coming to deal with finally with his grief and, I think they're both in a good headspace now. Uh, he's got like, a, he's got a yeah. plan and oh sorry go no go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying he's got a plan and she had like she has a guide or has a guide. He has a plan and he can you know kind of put his knowledge to use. And so they're both in kind of good yeah good spaces right now. I like that the chapter ends that he brought over a portable um, record player and they just sat listening to forty fives right and saying goodbye basically to the era where you did that and you had music and you listened to the Osmonds and Travolta and like because that's done now yeah so unless you need a musician or something that can write some but not on a record you know what I mean like it it's just not it's not the same so um now we're okay so chapter 37 Mm-hmm. Uh, Stu's walking along. At first, Stuart accepted the sound without question. It was such a typical part of a bright summer morning. Stu meets Glenn Bateman and Kojak the dog. They have cold beers, sandwiches, and become friends. Ah, Bateman has theories. They discuss their dreams. That night, Stu has the nightmare that he's back in the lab. So, talking about Bateman's theories, he just happens to to hit it on the head you know just kind of like i don't know like like i shouldn't say that because he was talking like i guess it was more of the uh like theory of what happened and everything like that and without any knowledge he just knows it's like it's a theory but it's you know exactly what happened it's like okay i mean he's a sociologist like i think oh i I don't know you're right i agree with you i was listening to it going so you're sure but he's got good theories yeah they're well-educated theories. For, yeah, but yeah. I like Stu. I right, not Stu. I like well, I like Stu. I like Glenn. You know, he's a good. Uh, we've seen that character uh, before in other uh, books that we've read. That that it intelligent. Reminded, it reminded me of yeah. Cell. 
I think. There's a character yes. in Cell that's very similar to this guy, right? The professor yes. with the young boy up yeah, at the school. Yeah, he's got the whole school. Yep, yep. yep that's exactly yeah. who I was thinking well, of. I was thinking of him and then also a mix of him and the guy he meets in the hotel, the uh, the gay guy he befriends from the hotel kind of thing. Uh, like a mix of just the talkative, that very uh, over-the-top kind of character kind of thing but yeah both both characters from cell reminded me of glenn or glenn reminded me of both of them mm -hmm. i would say in general we like people named glenn <laughs> they're okay yeah. i know a couple good ones uh, I'm so... in general <laughs> <laughs> let me see here glenn bateman in 2020 is played by greg kinner uh um, kinnear kinnear thank you i knew i said that wrong and i'm like how did i said it and in 1994 uh, oh, uh, Ray Walton. Uh, he is uh, a famous teacher. I'm trying to like teacher from TV and movie. You would know him if you saw him. I'll put it that way. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Wall from uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Really? No, I think I've actually, no, what? I watch a lot of things. I'm allowed to not know one. I know, I know. <laughs> I like that Glenn is a talker because Stu is not. They are excellent foils of each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, there's a dog, a I live know, dog, Kojak. a living dog. Right. Yeah, and we do yep, get some Kojak. information from Bateman. You know, it doesn't seem like it's affecting all different types of animals the same either. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like there aren't very many dogs. All of the cats are still around. Um, mm -hmm. The mice are still around um but horses and cows were talked about as well and i can't remember which one was gone and which one wasn't i think horses I think were cows are gone yeah. and horses are around yeah. yeah so and deer are around deer, deer are not affected yeah correct and so like that's interesting and i i thought it was having someone like glenn bateman here who is a oh, sorry cows yes deers yes horses dead okay sorry so the ones that you eat are still around, which is okay. That's pretty useful knowledge. But uh, you know, obviously, Technically you could eat a horse if you had to. Yeah, you can. Some cultures do. But uh, you know, he he brings up you know some other just sociology type theories of yeah, you might think getting rid of all the cockroaches would be a good idea, but I'm not so sure. Like you take something out. Or all the mosquitoes, right? And it, it can throw off the entire balance of everything. And mm -hmm. I think that's a valid point. It's like, oh, well, let's just get rid of this nuisance. But is that really a good idea? And so he's bringing up the point that with the, the populations of different things being thrown out of whack, it can mess up a lot more than just not having that one thing, right? It's, it's going to be a, a domino effect on what's going on. And he also has the theory about what would happen if you have one person in a small town, say Boston, who knows how to get the power plant up and running. Everyone in Boston's mm -hmm. going to be much better served as opposed to the people in Utica who don't. And so what do the people in Utica do? They might go in and attack the people from Boston to share or, you know, it might get really violent and that could be a negative thing as well. So. He basically brings up how technology is the number one currency um, moving forward in this broken down apocalyptic society, which I think is fair. Yeah. So on to 38. As the super flu epidemic wound down, there was a second epidemic that lasted roughly two weeks. Uh, it's a, there's a great chapter missing from the first edition, another add on which I'm so happy about, uh, dozens of stories of new people dying off non-flu-related. Uh, this, so, this was my favorite chapter in this same, section. Same. Hands this, down. This one's great. This one really All is. All right, so yeah. I'm going to start with Sam Tauber, the five-year-old. Oh, my God. So this one, I, I don't cry at stuff. It doesn't affect me, but I heard that, and I have a four-and-a-half, almost five-year-old, and I'm thinking, what the hell would he do? Uh, me and my wife just up and died. He's left alone. And like Karen Bond's like, okay, he's playing around, playing around. And then it's like, okay, how's he gonna die? Is he just gonna fall? You know, is he gonna like fall down a well? Is he gonna just starve to death? You know, kind of thing. 
or is he gonna get poisoned by berries because he finds some berries to start eating i'm thinking okay that's gonna be bad no kid falls down a goddamn ravine breaks both of his legs and dies 20 hours later from shock and blood loss it's he like fell down a well it was no. a well nope yeah it was um he never saw the old and rotted well cover half buried oh, okay. in the tall grass yeah so i read tall grass i read it as like a ravine. Yeah. okay my bad well covered so, and then he fell but, 20 feet broke both his legs yeah and lived for 20 more hours yeah yeah that one it was like oh i read that i was like oh fuck. that one hit me like that one that one hurt to read <laughs> and it was just like okay yeah he good had, story i mean he good had cool story but he had <laughs> right <laughs> yeah no most five year old myself. <laughs> All right. Um, Irma Fayette, the woman deathly afraid of weight rape, whose old gun when she's trying to defend herself from the evil man explodes. <laughs> no, and this no one brought me loss. right back. No great loss. That line made me brought me right back to just like laughing. And I was like, okay, I'm back to it. Like I'm glad that was Rebecca <laughs> back. Then we have George McDougal the high school mathematics teacher who he and his wife were practicing Catholics and had 11 children who yep. literally ran himself to death mm -hmm. because he couldn't handle his grief over all his, his whole family dying. It was funny in that uh, chat. He, he goes, uh, you know, <laughs> he said like he couldn't remember all of his kids' names typically, but he remembers what order they all died in specifically as well. So, that uh, that sucks. Patty, who seemed to be getting better. Yep. Yeah, Patty. Yep. Um, Eileen Drummond, who got very drunk. She wanted to get drunk because when she was drunk, she couldn't think. She wouldn't have to think about her family. Um, so that afternoon, she drank a whole bottle of creme de menthe and then got sick and threw up in the bathroom and then went to bed and lit a cigarette and fell asleep and burned down the house. And she didn't even have to think about it anymore ever. The wind had freshened and she also burned down most of Clouston. No great loss. No great loss. Yeah. Um, Arthur Stimson stepped on a rusty nail, would turn okay. gangrenous, yeah. tried to chop off his own foot, fainted halfway through, died of blood loss. A uh, 10 year old girl named Candace Moran fell off her bike and died of fractured skull. Milton Craslow, rancher in Harding County, New Mexico, was bitten by a rattlesnake, died half an hour later. Uh, Judy Horton, the 17 year old with the two year old baby. Uh huh. Right, who was kind of excited that everybody had died because now she was free, yeah. except had kept the dead bodies of her husband and her baby in the freezer and went to go visit them and forgot to prop the door open. She got locked in. Yep. Locked it in. did yep. not say how long it took her to die in there of yeah. starvation. I She's would still alive. It was a why. I mean, you figure there's you figure there's food in there. It's freezer. There's some sort of edible food that she can gnaw on. No, it says Judy Horton died in the company of her son and husband after all. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, but you just said when. Like it doesn't oh, say. Yeah. And so exactly. she's still like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim Lee of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, hooked up all the electrical outlets in his house to the gasoline generator and then electrocuted himself. Uh, Richard Hoggins, who had been addicted to heroin, um, and had never taken something that was a beyond 12% pure. Everything, it had always been cut. Well, this was 96% pure, and he was dead within six minutes. And as the chapter tells you, that was the last one they talked about. No great loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this chapter is, is the one that, I mean, where Stu is, not Stu, where Lloyd is, which we'll get to, I mean, it's that's happening all around the country. I'm sure you know uh, penitentiaries that inmates are just trapped in there. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's going down. So, yeah, that's what that's what that one makes me think of for sure. Yep. I, yeah. Mm. Okay. Thirty nine. Lloyd Henry was down on his knees. Uh, Lloyd is starving and going nuts. Flag appears and gives him the key. Yeah. So I don't think I mentioned the last episode. Randall Flagg is played by Alex Skarsgård uh, in 2020. And 
uh, Jeremy Sheridan in 94. Alex Scar. Of course, he's I played like by a Scars guard. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's the new king thing. You know, you get a Scars guard for your, your bad guy. There's a lot of them. So you have no, plenty to choose <laughs> exactly. from. Exactly. Who plays Lloyd? I know you uh, did last time, but I want to know. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Give me a minute. Talk about this and I'll find it. Yeah. So uh, this is the. Oh, go ahead, Bench. In 2020, it is Nick Wolf, and in 94, it is Miguel Ferrer. Ooh, I like Miguel Ferrer. He, he's a good one in that. Yeah, he he's good. Right? Oh, I just boy. like him in general. He he's not as uh yeah, and I I remember he's not as rednecky in it. He's mm-hmm. more more mobster ish style, but you know plays very similar. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, so this is the chapter that I was kind of referencing last time we talked about Lloyd. And, uh, you know, he's he's starving. And uh, whenever the uh, walking dude walks in and uh, he basically says, wow, you're like, uh, you know, he starts talking about dinner and oh, all the food he just ate. He's like, oh, I am torturing you, aren't I? I'm so sorry. And uh, <laughs> and he basically is enlisting Lloyd. Um but he says, like, you're you're like the, the poster child for Dachau summer camp right now, like, because he's so <laughs> starved looking and everything. And, um, yeah, he basically says, now I'm going to let you out and we're going to go get some food, but you're going to become my right hand man. You're you're my guy now. And is this the chapter that it might not be this one? Uh, I think it actually might be the next chapter that I'm thinking of that. So I think it might be Nick in his dream, but um, mm. basically he won't make eye contact with him with the walking dude. And he goes, I'm, uh, you know, he's like st- stammering and stuttering. And, and the walking dude's like, go ahead, just say, he's like, I'm pretty sure you're the devil, like, or, or <laughs> something. Like, I'm, you seem like bad news. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. It might be Nick's chapter, which we'll get to. No, but... th- this was, this was that chapter. Okay. This was a, uh, uh, Lloyd said, I, 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 yeah, you, you have to be the devil. Uh, and, you know, because, yeah, this can't be happening or I'm going insane, mm-hmm. you know, kind of thing. And so, no, that this was, yeah, definitely, it, it definitely gave me the Rick and Morty. He's the devil, Summer. You know, like, <laughs> he's literally, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> needful things episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's funny. Uh, but yeah, I, we also, we don't know for sure, but it seems like maybe he started nibbling on his cellmate's leg now as it's a little thinner than one leg is thinner than the other leg is what the walking dude says. And, you know, Lloyd's convinced that he didn't do it, but it kind of seems like maybe he he has a little bit. <laughs> Just in I can't blame him. I mean, I'm delirium. I will I will go full like in that situation and I got the access. I'm going full fucking cannibal. It's, you know, if it's me or, you know, and you're already dead. I'm taking a chomp, I, you know, so he's got nothing to feel bad about in my book. It's you do what you got to do to survive. I mean, he could have started t- eating the, the leather from his boots, you know, Stannis style. <laughs> right. But good I chapter. I have no opinion on that. Yeah, good chapter. Like, I think I'm glad that Lloyd got out because I think I like him, right? Like, he's an enjoyable character. Yes, he, yes. I, I, I'm curious, like, I always want to know, like, oh, what's he going to say this time, right? Because mm-hmm. every time he's on screen, mm-hmm. lack of better turn on screen, like, I giggle at something. Yeah. So, I'm not really invested in him. But, like, when he pops up, it's not so bad. So. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think he's an interesting character. And I'm, I'm definitely curious to see where. Where he goes as being, you know, right of flags, <laughs> right hand man uh-huh. from now on. So that's that's it. He got himself a good gig, is what I'm thinking. Sure. For, for him, that's a good gig. I mean, it's better than the alternative. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Chapter 40. All right. You'll go. Nick Andros lays sleeping but not quiet on the bunk in Sheriff Baker's office. Still in town, Nick almost dies of an infected scratch from the gunshot wound. He has fever dreams of Mother Abigail. He takes a bike and rides out of town. Um, So, you know, almost dead. We get the name Mother Abigail for real this time. 
and he decides to hop a bike out of town. This is the first time we've met her at all, right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I don't yeah. think we've had any. We, we, we've gotten uh, hints with a few dreams of cornfields and yeah. such. Sure. But this is, yeah, the first time we've we, seen and or heard from her. We have a location. We have yeah. a name. We have directions. Clear cut sign. Go this way and hang a left. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, yeah. Nick's Nick's not feeling so great, right? You know, these these fever dreams are. I mean, he's covered in sweat. You know, it would suck if he died <laughs> this way <laughs> when everyone, <laughs> like, you know, he's one of the survivors. Like that would be a shitty way to go out. I mean, just like the whole chapter we. We just talked about the second wave epidemic of mm -hmm. non super flu deaths, but um, yeah, we he also he does talk to. I think he deals with uh, a dream that has uh, Randall Flag in it as well. So and he Randall Flag is trying to convince Nick to work for him to come and join him, and in these dreams he's able to hear and speak, and he was surprised by the tone of his voice it was nice crisp clean tone and it you know that was basically what it seemed like Randall flag was offering him to join it mm -hmm. basically here's the cost to sell your soul uh and you know and these are the things that you'll get for joining my my troop of uh, merry men and nick that's when he then goes and talks to mother abigail and He's like, you know, Nick's saying, you know, how do I, how do I keep telling this guy no? And she goes, well, how do you breathe? You just can do it. Like, you, you just keep going. You just, I can't tell you what else, but keep doing what you're doing. And uh, she's definitely giving him some advice, but not so much so that it's like, you need to do this and this and this. It's definitely more of a trust yourself kind of advice. Right. Because it's realistic, but without being mean. Like, yeah, you, you're good. Like. Mm -hmm. You come to these parts, you come see me, right? How do I get out of this? Nobody ever does. You just look up to be the best. So, and then he wakes up. He's in Shoyo again, but he's alive. Yep. So he's not the uh, only person who rides out of town on a bike, right? I mean, but... uh. We don't know. So he his is a 10 speed. His is like a bicycle. And I think yes. the other times we've talked about bikes, they've been more like motorcycles from uh, what we're going to gather in the next mm -hmm. couple chapters. So, yeah. 41? Benji. Oh, you're you're muted, Ben. I apologize. I thought I hit the button. Uh, we actually do know that uh, Harold and uh, Franny had talked about leaving on motorcycles mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah so but now okay so i think i know what you're going with with the next chapter uh and it's uh larry woke up at half past eight to sunlight and the sound of birds happy fourth of july rita kills herself with pills uh larry acknowledges some relief he ain't no nice guy leaves his body in the tent almost kills himself on a harley and sleeps in a park feels like he is being watched so <laughs> I enjoy this chapter. First of all, yeah, by Rita, you 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 are an addition to the story. No great uh, loss. No, no, no great, great loss. loss uh, yeah. But like, I love how Larry gets up. And he's singing the national anthem as he's taking his morning piss, just right outside the tent. I absolutely would do the same thing. Fourth of July morning, you know, you got that just free free hanging going, and he turns around to go have some early morning fun, and she's dead. And it's like, and he starts flipping out, like, how long do you sleep next to her? And this, and it's like, it's not your, I mean, I, I get it, shock and everything like that. But it's like, yeah, you know, you, you kind of should have seen it coming. The pills she was taking, the everything she was kind of doing and all that. And you know, don't freak but out. He's I mean, you so to, don't young. Freak. He has no, yeah. of course he didn't. Like, and not just like Adrian, like maturity wise, he's so young. He has yeah. just, Yeah. Anyway, I agree. I'm, I'm saying more the the freak because he starts freaking out. Like I was gonna have sex with her. Oh my god! It's like, yeah, yeah dude. I mean, you, know, you didn't know. You know, you know, it's like, eh. I, I I get it, but at the same time, it's like, eh. get over yourself. <laughs> yeah, move on. Yeah. So he decides to move on, and he he packs up what he can and 
takes a takes a motorcycle <laughs> and won't go over twenty mile an hour until he finds a uh, sports shop where he buys a new tent or a new sleeping bag and uh, and a helmet and he won't go over twenty five mile an hour with <laughs> with the helmet on. He's 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 definitely pretty nervous about riding the motorcycle, yeah. which it doesn't sound like he's ever ridden before. So I mean that's that's fine. But and- he wasn't before Greta was on the bike with him. I think it's that idea of like. Now, if something happens to me, like I'm alone, alone, like because when he's like because between not having Rita and then the spill that he kind of took, it, it's there's if no something happens, there there's nobody else. There's no safety yeah. anymore. But she also kept him in check and made him go. That was one thing she was like she would hold him tight and like basically wouldn't let him go above twenty twenty five. And so yeah, like, but he, this is his own fear kind of coming out that he didn't yes. have before. Mm-hmm. yep yep and i think the other thing too is you know this is an abandoned wasteland i mean he doesn't know what's around the next turn you know it could be a dumped over tanker truck with gasoline all over like you know it, he's he's nervous about everything now and i think that's a good point melissa of, you know without having another pair of hands there that if something should happen that can take care of you yeah i mean safety that completely gone you know there's it's he's he could be toast without you know an extra pair of hands to help him out. I will say, I don't think he ever saw Rita as somebody who would take care of him, but he was so focused on taking care of her that he didn't have the time to think about caring for himself. And Mm -hmm. now there's nobody left to worry about. Yep. Yep. So, see you, Rita. Yep. No great loss. No great loss. Chapter 42. All right, this is our last chapter of this section. While Larry Underwood was taking his 4th of July spill on a state away, only a state away, Stuart Redman was sitting on a large rock at the side of the road and eating his lunch. Stu is carrying a rifle now. He left Glenn behind. Harold and Franny ride up on Hondas. Tense meeting, but Stu and Franny connect. Harold is resentful, openly hostile towards Stu. They eventually partner up and head west. Picking up Glenn, Stu realizes he does want Franny. You meet the nicest people on a Honda. <laughs> I, I don't know. That, that, that line, as soon as Franny said that, about, have you ever ridden a Honda? It's made, it, you know, that line stuck out to me. I don't know. Yeah, that's funny. But So, yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the start of, okay, I, Harold's no noise guy. And I wanted to start a running joke of when we meet a new character, is it a nice guy or no nice? He ain't no nice guy. You know, <laughs> where 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 do we fall? And I think by this chapter, Harold falls into he ain't no nice guy. I don't know. I mean, I think he's young and stupid about girls, right? I mean, I think that's obvious. And, you know, he's what, 16 years old, I think. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's terribly surprising that he's developed a pretty harsh crush on on the only girl that is going to be in the rest of his life, potentially, that he ever gets to talk to. Um, I mean, have we met another living female yet besides her? Rita. We've got Nick. We've got Larry. Rita's dead. Well, yeah. Like, no. But the, I'm, seriously, yeah. who's left? Right. And like, I don't think it's terribly, especially because it it's his sister's best friend. Apparently she's a babe, you know, like that's been talked about how, you know, I, she's very attractive. So I can't, I can't deny that I get where Harold is coming from to some extent, you know, like that's an easy thing for a 16 year old kid to be interested in that. He comes across very protective and very aggressive towards the stranger, which I don't think is completely unreasonable either, you know, not knowing anything about who this person is. And he goes a little overboard, in my opinion, but I can see where he's feeling protective of her in general. There we go. All right, he's back. <laughs> yeah, like everything just kind of froze. I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway. So I. I understand he's young. I agree. No concept of how to be around a girl. Doesn't know how to do it. For sure. No experience. 
I'll give you that. I even understand the idea of like, we're out on the road and we don't know who's out there and a female is like really at risk. Mm -hmm. But it's the fact that he acts like he owns her, that he is in control of her, yeah. that I don't care what the hell is going on. That is never <laughs> okay. And, and, and I think Stu says something that really like, and I'm, go I'm going to say it wrong. I'm not going to say it the way Stu says it in the book, but it's that idea of like, let's see if I can find it really quick. Um, here we go. Some girls can be owned and some could not, right? And the fact that she's got that I want line in her eyebrows, like Stu notices right away that Franny is not somebody that can, that needs a controller. Right. Like Rita. Some, like Rita. Rita would have done great with Harold. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Totally. Weirdly. Oh, yeah. I, I just, so, there is something to said we're having some sort of social acumen. And Harold needs to read the fact that the person he's with, yes, there, there is something to be said for like watching out for her. But you don't need to be in charge of, she doesn't need a boss and she doesn't need an owner. And you are screwing that up regardless of who you meet. Because anybody they meet, Harold's going to be like that. I, yeah. Yeah. No, I absolutely agreed. I read this, it's like, like first couple chapters, I'm like, okay, give the kid a benefit of the doubt, you know, kind of thing. And everything like that but now it's like yeah you, you treat Stu like that just and like automatically he can read their Stu can read the room i mean hell anybody can read the room that's not you know harold uh, uh, yeah not, not harold you know is gonna read hey you know what maybe you don't want to join them what you want them to join you because of safety and like legitimate concerns that you might have fine fair don't come off like a fucking preteen you know little bitch because your girl you know is giving this guy googly eyes or would, you know whatever you, you think, and it's like that's not your call. She's not your girl. It's not your choice. Sorry, dude. You know, three three is better than two. You know, and so it's yeah, it's like okay, yep, okay. I see where this kid's going, and yep, this won't turn end up well for him. Stu handles it beautifully. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Stu's great. Man, he really he gets it. He just, I mean, how many times have I we want to said see that? a flop. Yeah, I, I want to, like, Stu's going to get on my nerves a bit, I think, down the line, unless we start seeing a flaw, like some sort of flaw in him, because right now he's done everything right. He's the, per he's Superman. There's no, there's no interesting fact about him because he's so good and he's just so perfect. Like kind of thing with Larry, Larry can be a dick. Larry ain't no nice guy. There's an interesting fact. Franny. Franny can be kind of a bitch. That kind of makes her kind of an interesting character. She's a stubborn, like a strong-headed, you know, female. Harold, he's an asshole, you know, juvenile. There's characters with flaws that are fun to watch. Stu right now is fun to watch for me because he's still new. But down the line, if it doesn't change, I could see that becoming a bit of an annoyance, in my opinion. People have to have depth, and you know. See, I see Stu as like... Remember from Needful Things, the sheriff? Yes. Right? And he was okay because you're right. He was a little too, like, perfect Sheriff Pangborn. And I like Sheriff Pangborn. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is, like, Stu has not put himself in a position of power in any way, shape, or form. He's just, like, going along to get along. I, and I think that's the thing that makes – that I have no problem with this whole he's making all the right steps because he's just – a quiet country boy trying to like make it in for him. I think, I mean, granted, everybody's lost people. So everybody's world's turned upside down, but he's been shipped off twice and yeah. shut away twice and almost like they've yeah. shot him up with the actual flu. He didn't get it. They came to kill him. It didn't happen. Like, I think the fact that he has survived by making good choices is simply because 
like he's just a good guy making good choices not because he has it, it, for lack of a better term, Harry Potter saving people complex, like we see in Sheriff Pangle or some of the other perfect good guys that are choosing to be the good guy. He's just trying to survive, man, at this point. True. And, and I com completely agree. And like, yeah. like I said, up to this point, I love him. I, I right. He's done everything right, and it's great. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I think for me... That's why I'm not worried about it yet, because he hasn't had to, like, he's not choosing any of it. It's not like, yeah. oh, I'm, I, no, he's just like, I, I, I like, I just want to walk outside. All right. Luke, thoughts? Yeah. All right. There's another chapter. Uh, it sounds okay. like they're going to go work together. I, I didn't, I must have missed the. The very last line, you know, Stu realizes he does want Franny. I, I didn't catch that. Mm -hmm. I, I missed that yeah. on my, my listens. But basically, as they were packing up the bikes, he he glanced over. He's like, I might have lied to Harold, you know, like something along yeah. those lines. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, whatever. As long as. <laughs> yeah. I, I think strength in numbers is a good thing for sure. And I, the fact that they went and picked uh, Glenn back up, I thought that was that was good. Well, um, they were heading back to them. They haven't gotten way. them yet. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I, I thought that's good. Good, good chapter. All right. My favorite thing, Bench, I'm going to let well, you go I'll, first. Were we not going to do questions? Oh, you're right. I forgot about questions. Whew. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> go for it. What's your question? All right. Mine's pretty simple, straightforward. How realistic, seeing as what we went through with a semi pandemic kind of thing? Oh, no. This was a pandemic. I've, I've well, listened to a whole article about it. This was a pandemic, but continue. <laughs> Comparatively to the stand, ours is a pseudo pandemic. Anyway, I, I, I'm just never less mind. lethal. Yes. So my the reason I'm saying that is, how realistic is it that the roads and like interstates, uh, the tunnel I get now, the tunnel I understand being packed up and jammed up with all the cars and stuff from people being in there trying to get out and being mowed down by the military. But the rest of the roadways and everything, New York, again, busy. But like the interstates, having traffic jams all over from people just randomly dying in their cars. You had a, a day or two of getting sick to get home. Like it, you're not – I, I had to drive around during our pandemic and everything like that when it was first kicking off. There was no traffic. I could drive across the entire city in 15 minutes, no problem, because people were staying home. Either they were sick or they were just out of it. You would run in the same thing here. You're getting sick. You're going to stay home. The highways and interstates aren't going to be completely jammed up where you can't get a car around, where you have to get a motorcycle to you know maneuver all this broken down traffic all over the place. It just, it, to me, it just seemed unrealistic. Uh, I was wondering your guys' opinions on it. Like, does it make sense or is it more story driven just to use as a point? I think comparatively to what we've lived through, we knew it was coming and we shut it down before everybody got sick, but this spread. So, I mean, we're talking within two weeks, 96% of the population was dead or, or more two weeks. True. Right. And so to me, I think the panic that sets in it's, it's the rush of toilet paper. It's the, I, I, if I go over here, if I, if I go to my aunt's house, if I go to this, I, maybe I can get out before we get, before we catch it. Cause here's the other thing. This was, you know, 30 something years ago when there was an internet and there wasn't immediate news feed in the 24 hour <laughs> news cycle and, you know, news pop-ups on my phone. Like, I don't know just how bad it is in the state next door or two states over, right? Especially if the media is being controlled by the army, it's really possible that there was a lot of people thinking it'd be safe. Plus we heard Boulder mass exodus out of there, right? So like, I, I, I'm not so surprised by it. Um, I think compared to what we lived through, it feels very different, but I don't think it's because it's story-based. I think it's just like, I don't know. It, it, it's panic. Plus they're half delirious, right? Like, oh, we got to get the car. I, I don't know. I, it didn't bother me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think 
for an apocalyptic story, you have to cut off technology to some extent. And that's one reason that I, I think it is slightly plot driven. But I mean, if you think about it, you know, say there's an accident on the road, right? As this everyone's flocking out of. And again, we're kind of focusing on New York City mentally for me on that question, because that's where we see it most. Right. That they can't get out any other way. And that's a, a very locked up city to some extent, yeah. you know, I mean, with it all being islands, uh, that's very different than, OK, well, we'll just drive across the cornfield and get the fuck out, like which we could do in other places like around here. So I think in that purview, I think it's slightly more reasonable because you have so many millions of people who are looking to evacuate the area at the same time to try to get ahead of it and say even a couple people have it and you know start being delirious while driving cause an accident in the tunnel you know which we saw there was that one truck that came flying in too quick try to cut in and took out four or five other vehicles which then there's no emergency system to get that cleaned up so that just stays there and everyone that's behind it no 400 cars aren't all going to back up out of the tunnel. They're just going to stay there and keep trying to be idiots going forward, and then they get blocked in. So that's that's where I think it makes sense of just the, the volume and, of people. And to add to that, think about what they did in Franny's hometown. They blocked the entrances with giant vehicles and manned them for a while so nobody could even get in. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, thinking about the roadways throughout the country, how many small towns, and I don't mean like Interstate 70, which is a four lane highway across 15 states, but most of your highways, right? What we think of as highways are two lane that yeah. go through small towns. How many of those small towns built the same type of barricade? Because we don't want you in. So I could see that being a cause for concern. Mm -hmm. That's fair. And, and, uh, and, and you're right, Luke. Uh, you both have good points on it. And because I was reading it as, okay, all these cars are here because all these people just had the flu and they died in their car. Like I was thinking walking dead style, right. you know, right. kind mm -hmm. of just pile up, but that makes, yeah, more sense of, you know, one accident can jam everything up and then people are like, fuck it. I'm just leaving. And they just and they leave just their leave cars. Vehicle. And yeah. Then, yeah. Guess what? I mean, everyone's stuck. You're, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that, that, real quick, I, I think. So I will retract my annoyance because, I, yeah, I was reading it one way, but that makes way sense and plausible. It is definitely plot convenient, though, to make it more <laughs> difficult. Like, and I do think yeah. we're getting it from specific areas where it's more difficult to get around. You know, like, yeah, like I said, New York City. Like, I can understand how that can get shut down real quick. Like, you know, it's yeah. Like Nick, I don't think would have a problem getting a car anywhere he needed to go in where he's at in arkansas he'd they weren't fine. shutting stuff yeah. down they were yeah yeah he'd but be fine that's fair so uh that's not true they had some military in some places there too i like i don't think a car is going to be as practical as a motorcycle i just don't i think you're going to run into things and then you'll have to abandon your car and then you're stuck like walking until the next yeah car. so I don't know. I think a motorcycle makes a little more sense. Just depends. A little it more. Makes, it yeah. just depends. Um, so I, I had a question. And how many children do you think died in wave two? Many. Oh, yeah. Many. I mean, I, like, like we saw, there's, I mean, they covered a couple different kids dying for different things. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the quickest, like on that second wave idea, like, the highest number would be children who can't take care of themselves, who mm -hmm. just starve to death or, uh, you know, I wouldn't say get hit by a car because we were just talking about how little vehicle traffic there is right now. But, you know, it, without any supervision. The emergency room problems. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I, I think that number would be pretty high over the next couple of weeks. Follow up question. Will we meet any, like, will any children survive? Do you think, yes. like, I think so. Okay. Because it's scary, right? Like, how far apart are the people who survived? It seems like Brandon and Harold are so relatively 
unusual to have two people from the same town mm -hmm. both well, be immune. Yeah, let's do some quick numbers. Uh, you know what I mean? Like New York City is different. That right. we're talking millions and millions of people, but yeah, right. But the small town of in Maine, there's two. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, how many other places? Like, it's just Nick and Shoyo. So, it's so let's say 1990. We based it off that uh, estimated population was about 300 million in the U.S. 96.5%, so 0.5% of that is 289,000 people remaining. So it's not unheard of to have, you know, one or two from a town from, you know, from a town the size of, you know, Franny's to survive. Nick's town, probably not going to have many, you know, you might have maybe one or something like that. Uh, that'll make it through. But that's 200,000 people. That's the state of Wyoming. You know, you have the population of the you know, state of Wyoming spread across the entire expanse of the United States to find each other. So, I mean, it's, I, I think there's a good possibility we'll see some and, you know, there'll be, it's easier to interact than you think. Like you go drive around just the road. worry about the kids. Nobody's not yeah. necessarily like looking no, but them. I don't, I, I, it just depends on who finds them. It's one of those, if you know, who, who's going to come okay. across and find somebody, you know, decent, they're going to do what they can. Okay. All right. Luke, did you have any questions? I did not. Um, but what I will okay. ask is, say you were in this situation as dire as this has been. Where you live now, you know, same house that you live in, same situation. Where would you go if you decided I need to go somewhere else? Where would you go? South. Wait, during the pandemic or once everybody was dead and it was just me? This period where, say, you're Isolation. the only one in your neighborhood that survived. Or do you have, I'm going, to, do I you have to go? You know, like, could you stay where you're at? Yeah. Personally, I'm going south. Uh, a better weather. Just, I'm sick of the cold, Disagree, and I'd rather. But that's okay. Uh, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'll go down to New Orleans area, of, you know, Louisiana, somewhere around there. Uh, you can fish in the Gulf, maybe Atlantic. You know, down Florida style. F you can fish in the ocean. You know, you have a solid food supply after you eat everything else that's already pre-made all the twinkies and shit that survived for years you know decent weather uh and yeah that's pretty much it it's uh, more like you're more likely going to find more people heading south than you are going to find them heading north people are going to have the same mentality of going south better weather better environment you know probably south 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 uh west even like san diego like if i can live in san diego hell yeah you know, without paying the taxes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. That's that's where I'll go. Yeah, actually, that's where I would go, San Diego. I think, I mean, I like the idea of being somewhere like warmer, so it's not me trying to heat a whole house in the winter by myself. But I would want to go somewhere with a lot of farm animals so that I had... I could get my own milk and I could get my own eggs and I could like, I, I, I just, because eventually that kind of stuff would run out. So I would want to be somewhere where I could have a, access to a library that could teach me how to keep those animals alive and how to farm. Cause I know nothing, um, which means I probably have to go to Luke's house to just steal his books. That, that's On probably where I start. Yeah. Right. That kind of stuff. But I feel like that's the smartest move if there's not some sort of like outside force saying, hey, come hang out with me and corn. Um, because that's sustainable over time and I don't eat fish. As much as I would rather go somewhere south and warm and just live on a beach. Maybe I'd go sleep in Cinderella's castle. There you go. There's an answer. Ex Here's the problem, though. Like, there's no electricity, which means the rides aren't running, and so that's not really worth it. And nobody's going to make the churros for me. So, <laughs> churros are a big I'd deal. I'd, I'd probably like go commandeer a farm for myself. 
How about you? I think the farm idea is smart. I think being close to rivers is smart as well. I mean, honestly, we're not at a, at a bad spot right here in St. Louis right. for basically be able to do both completely well enough. Um, I mean, there's a reason St. Louis is where it's at. It's historically, geographically <laughs> significant. So like, it, it just kind of makes sense. Um, I, and eventually I was really thinking thing going with... up 79, like towards Clarksville, to be sure. honest. Yeah, like... no, I think that's reasonable. That's reasonable for sure. Uh, New Orleans wouldn't be a bad choice because you still have the river there as well and the ocean if you basically to be able to do both um, to yeah. some extent. So I think that's 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 pretty fair. I think I'd want to go the opposite of where everyone's going there, though. You know, I, I just feel like I'd want to try to do the self-sufficient thing for a while uh, and stay away from large epicenters of people that could uh, go poorly uh, with you've seen so many apocalyptic movies people tend to come together but it always tends to create larger issues that it gets out of hand really really quickly so i think i'd go more on the trying to handle it isolation wise self-sufficient wise so i would go check to make sure that all of my siblings and family members were dead so that we could like hunker down together i yeah, would do that no this yeah. to me this we were after that all everyone else you're okay. the only one okay that was yeah because yeah, i mean I've, ideally at least a couple of us could make it <laughs> i would team up that'd be a I good, mean, good problem to have statistically we're probably looking at two <laughs> of the whole family there's probably probably two two would make it through i think if dad was one of them we'd be set oh everyone oh, yeah. everyone that would be left would be better off that's for sure Talk about a useful human. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Look okay. at you get drunk. That's about it. <laughs> I can't do any of it. Like none of my skills apply to wilderness survival. <laughs> I'd I'd be all right. I'd be fine. You'd be fine. And like I think Lorelai would be fine. She'd figure it out. I would die. <laughs> And there's I'd Melissa. Be a wave too. She's a Rita. No, <laughs> I know, I know. No, that was, that was meant to be a low. No, <laughs> I am not a Rita, but I am like the girl who died from a fractured skull. Like, that, right? That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, ha- I, I have a very specific skill set, and they do not translate well to wilderness survival. Okay. Um, how about my favorite thing? So I'm taking the obvious one, uh, the second epidemic. That was just, it, it, it hit every single note I needed it to. It made me sad. It made me laugh. And it, I was just happy. One other thing that I wanted to point out, though, that I think it, the first occurrence was it, it was in this chapter, and I think it happened later, uh, but it might have happened earlier. There was a lot of guns blowing up on themselves in this section. I know there's at least two where literally they pulled the trigger and the gun blew up on the person. Uh, the one woman in this one, and there's another one. And I'm like, guns don't do that much. That just, again, shows me, like, King's, like, ignorance to it of, you know, gun activity. But it's like, guns don't do it th- that often to where you just pull the trigger and it blows up in your hand. You know, just, it, that stood out to me. It, it was more than once, more than just that one time. But anyway, yeah, the, the second epidemic, it was just a great chapter. Luke. That was the right answer, so I don't have another one. I, I, <laughs> I, I agree. I think that's that's one of the best chapters we've had in this book. Um, I do really like that first chapter we had in this one, 26, where it's the media being shut down. I thought that that's was also a, good. a great chapter. But I'm going to throw, this is more of an honorable mention to those two, um, Trashy. Mm-hmm. I'm excited <laughs> to see more yes! about Trash Kids. <laughs> I just thought, what a... What a unique character uh, from what we've seen in most of these Stephen King books. I don't think we've had anybody exactly like this guy. It, it kind of touches on maybe kind of like the Bowers crew kind of uh, like Hoxtetter, oh, 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 what's Patrick Hoxtetter yes, a little bit. Yes. Um, so that's the only one I can think of that's similar, but it's, yeah. he's, man, this is a character right here. I'm I'm interested to see where this guy goes. <laughs> And I'll give another honorable mention to Lloyd. The Lloyd chapters, they were, yeah, just interesting in just seeing that pure desperation 
the in, inside mind of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not as a favorite thing, but just as like the tunnel, Larry's tunnel journey and always me stands out to me. Sure. I can't like decades worth of memories. So I can't go by without mentioning the formativeness of that. Yeah, I that feels like it's a pretty iconic thing. Like it it felt like it should be there. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Except they shouldn't have been there because who would go in a fucking tunnel? But <laughs> I, I, know. I feel like I should pull up a map I, and it, research. It's, but it's where much, did they start? It, it's much further up the the tunnel or the bridge uh, going to New Jersey. It's many blocks gotcha. further north. Then why are you going to Jersey? They should have gone with the Bronx guy. <laughs> but doesn't the isn't the Bronx just? another island isn't that on yeah but you can Long still continue itself. further up and cross over the more bridges i, I don't know the new york geography so all right all right um that's it final thoughts don't really have one on it good good section uh it's a good setup like i said i, I kind of dubbed this the isolation uh section where people are just kind of finding each other and it's a good buildup it's it kind of it makes you want to keep going and seeing where everything's heading now everything's kind of starting to form into a different idea than what it started as yeah it does feel like okay. things are about to transition to some extent uh i know the first time i went through this section i was like man really nothing happened like it just felt like nothing really happened like at all and yep. I think I still kind of feel that way, but pieces have moved a bit. You know, there was no, it's funny because there are some big action things that do go on, like trash can blowing up the oil refinery. Like that, that's a huge thing, but it doesn't seem like it did anything. You know, it's just an interesting point. But um, yeah, I mean, as a good section, it definitely feels like it's getting ready to transition to be more, uh, if I had to guess, people coming together even more so figuring out where people need to go and i think we're going to start seeing more collaboration between characters um as either they find somewhere that they feel safe and can set up shop or if they just continue to travel i hope not every single person just travels the whole next section because that's what this felt like right now is we're just aimlessly going somewhere look one so that's i guess my final thought on it just ready to keep reading yep let's yep. go let's go fair all right with that said make sure you're following us on socials that floats down here on twitter and instagram send us your digital yeah send your emails that floats on here gmail.com i don't your have anything monster today shoutings. monster shouter up i had one and i just literally lost it as melissa was talking it was the uh, oh, send us your digital uh, no great losses to <laughs> floats down near gmail.com. Make sure you're checking out all of our stuff at the podcast that.com. Subscribe and like our videos on YouTube. Make sure you hit the bell to make sure to to know when we're going live the next time. Also, subscribe and comment on iTunes. It definitely helps us out. Yeah, this show and all of our shows at the podcast that.com and drawbridge media are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. You can learn more about our fun reward tiers at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. Join us on the second Monday of March when we continue on the stand. We're moving into book two. We're going to do chapters 43 through 47. Sounds like not very many chapters. It's five chapters, but that's 179 pages. You'll flow too. Stay imaginary. Thanks.